So today we're going to talk about COVID-19 and I wanted to hit um, some of the important features about this virus and then of course leave sufficient time for discussion. It began in this region of China right here and this is the Hubei province and Wuhan is the largest city within that province. And over here to the right, we see a picture of Wuhan. The first recognition of uh, the virus in the West was this report on January 6th. And the virus itself was isolated on January 7th. We know the first case of um, COVID virus that was reported COVID virus disease that was reported was on December, the individual became ill on December 1st and was hospitalized um, quite a bit, several days after that. So that was the first case that we recognized. Now the fact that the person became ill on December 1st suggests that he was probably exposed sometime in November. So our best guess is that this virus probably be probably began in humans sometime in November, and maybe as far back as October. On January 19th, a 35-year-old man who had spent time in Wuhan and had returned to the United States on January 15th developed respiratory symptomatology. Because he was well aware that there had been a problem of a respiratory disease spreading wildly throughout Wuhan, he immediately reported to his physicians that he had been in Wuhan and he was concerned he might have that virus. And it turned out that he did. On January 30th, the World Health Organization declared this virus to be a global health emergency. And on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared it to be a pandemic. It wasn't until March 30th, 19 days later than in the WHO declared it a pandemic, then uh, did the President of the United States declare it to be a national emergency. Many people feel that a lot of very valuable time and lives were lost because of that delay. So what I want to discuss with you today is this long list of items, but I'll go over them pretty quickly. Uh, because I think some of these don't uh, demand a lot of time. Um, but I think covering all of these things will give us a very good background to this disease. So let's begin with the first question. What is SARS-CoV-2? Well, we know it's a large family of viruses um, called the coronaviruses that SARS-CoV-2 belongs to. Now you'll notice that I'm using the name SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus. The disease that SARS-CoV-2 causes, we call COVID-19. The 19 being, of course, for 2019 when it was first isolated. Of those at least 300 or more coronaviruses, we know of several that just cause human disease or primarily cause human disease. The first four that are listed here we've known about for a long time. And they, they cause the common cold. Uh, they cause about a third of all the cases of the common cold in the United States. They're pretty innocuous viruses, although when you have a cold, of course, you're pretty frustrated with it. But they rarely cause serious disease. The first time we encountered really serious disease from SARS-CoV-2 was in 2002 and 2003 with what's called now SARS-CoV-1. Are the SARS virus. This virus uh, was not nearly as contagious as SARS-CoV-2, but it uses the same receptor site to get inside of our cells that SARS-CoV-1 um, COV uses. This disease was first described in October of 2002 by the Chinese, but they didn't inform anybody worldwide until late in January of 2003. It wound up killing a little over 9,000 human beings, and it had a mortality rate of close to 10%. It was essentially gone by June of 2003, and the last case reported was in July, early July of 2003. 
So it did not effectively spread through the human population. The next glimpse we had of a serious player in the coronavirus family was Middle East res uh, Respiratory Syndrome, CoV-1 or MERS CoV-1. This has been restricted geographically to the Middle East, uh, although there was a, a short outbreak in South Korea. This, this continues to circulate, uh, having caused a little over 2,500 human cases. So it's not nearly as contagious as SARS-CoV-2, uh, but it has a mortality rate of uh, around 40, 45%. And then the third coronavirus that causes serious disease is SARS-CoV-2, the virus that we're talking about today. Where did SARS-CoV-2 originate? This is the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because I can tell you that there is absolutely no evidence that it did ori originate there, and nor does the science show it could have based upon its genetic structure. So this has been a, um, a popular theory amongst uh, an ill-informed conspiracy theorists, but this is not where the virus began. This is where the virus began, in bats. Uh, we can trace back its genetic lineage to show that this has been a virus in bats, and then it's spilled over to human beings. We don't know if it's spilled over directly to human beings, or whether it had what we call an intermediate host, whether it spilled over to another animal. For example, for a while we were thinking pangolins were the animal that it spilled over to and that humans caught it from this animal. We know that SARS-CoV-1 spilled over from bats to a cat-like animal called civets. And we know that MERS spilled over from bats to camels. But to date, we haven't identified an intermediate host and it's still possible that it's spilled over directly from bats to humans. This is a series of slides taken from the New York Times in April, and it looks at the genome of the uh, RNA. It's got about 30,000, um, quote, letters. Um, and if we look at how this has evolved, I'll show you just a few of the examples from this lovely New York Times article. <clears throat> this was the actually coming back one. Um, this was the original virus that was isolated on December 26th, or at least the first one that we isolated. Um, on January 8th, so just a very short time later, there was one mutation noted on the virus, as noted here. And then the case in Seattle, um, showed some additional mutations. And when we look at these mutations, they're identical to the ones that were found right around the same time in Fujian and Guangdong provinces. So it's clear that the Seattle case that we saw came from these areas. This was from uh, February 24th, so a little bit about a month later, from a high school student in Seattle. And you'll notice that the mutations are quite different in this in, in the genome of this virus, um, suggesting that this virus had been circulating independently in the Seattle area, probably for well over a month. And finally, in looking at the genomes, this is where we are through April, December through April, and these are all the different changes we've seen in the genome, the mutations. So for example, this has had close to about 25 different mutations. And there's some gaps where there have been no mutations. And this might suggest that these are critical spots in the genome where mutations would be lethal to the virus. A lot more needs to be learned about that. And here's a nice cartoon of the virus. And we're going to be particularly interested in these spike glycoproteins because they're the ones that attach to our receptor sites. And I'll go into that detail in just a moment. We'll also pay a little bit of attention to this RNA in the nuclear protein, nuclear protein. And I want to comment on the envelope in terms of how fragile this virus is outside of human beings. So the question I'd like to address now is what mutations humanized it? What allowed it to jump from bats to humans and why has it been so successful in humans? These are the protein products made from the genome. And here's the 
spike, area, spike proteins that are made, and these are the non-structural proteins that actually later get divided up in the host cells. And the spike protein produces this trimer uh, that is involved in allowing the organism to enter our cells and reproduce. We don't know what mutations have occurred in this spike protein, uh, in the genome for, to code for the spike protein yet that allowed it to be humanized, but it is structurally slightly different than the spike proteins found in bats. We also know that, note that human furans, which are proteases, enzymes that break down proteases, are found in oral respiratory secretions and different parts of our body found in the GI tract as well. And these furans uh, alter the structure of the spike protein to make it more likely to be able to attach to our cells. So something may have altered the structure of the spike protein itself or made it more susceptible to human furans. This is still being worked out. But in any case, what the spike protein can do now is it can attach to receptors on certain cells that we have. This is a, a cartoon showing the spike protein attaching to what's called the ACE2 receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. And here's a nice scanning electron micrograph of the virus attaching to these ACE2 receptors. And you can see where the virus gets its name, the crown or corona. And this is a cartoon showing the virus attaching to these ACE2 receptors and this allows it to be internalized and go through its life cycle that I will not go through today. But I did want to point out that the ACE2 receptors are found primarily in lower airways of human beings. They're also found to a lesser extent in the gastrointestinal tract, in parts of the liver, and in the kidneys, and in the myocardium or the heart cells. Um, and this becomes important in our understanding some of the complications that we're seeing that I'll talk about later. SARS-CoV-1 um, also attaches to the ACE2 receptor, so it has the same pathogenesis. MERS, on the other hand, attaches to a different receptor. It's found also in the lower airways, and MERS can cause pneumonia, but MERS tends to cause much more gastrointestinal tract and kidney problems than SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2, and that's probably because it uses a different receptor. So what is the prevalence and incidence of this um, infectious disease? In terms of the prevalence, we have lots of data, and our feet are firmly planted in the air in terms of what it actually is. That is, we don't know exactly how many people are infected with this virus worldwide, in the United States or even locally, but we're starting to get answers to this. Major League Baseball players were screened and the prevalence was 0.7%. Now this was clearly a younger population. A study that I'll talk about more in a moment, the Mission Bay study done by UCSF showed a prevalence of 1.4% of the population that they studied. This was primarily a Hispanic uh, population. The Santa Clara County study that was done by Stanford, and there have been some interesting, uh, there's an interesting controversy about the Stanford study, um, showed a prevalence of around 3%. In France, the prevalence before um, sheltering in place was about 4%. Uh, it's not clear what it is right now. In Los Angeles, the prevalence is higher, it's about 4.65%. And in New York, in a small study in, in obstetrics patients, they found a prevalence of 15%. This was during the surge in New York. Overall, best guess is in the United States, probably around three, maybe 4%, maybe as high as 5% of the population has been infected. Flipping that upside down, it means that the vast majority of people in the United States remain susceptible to this infection. If we look at the incidence, um, by the way, the prevalence data is from antibody data. If we look at the incidence, this is from RNA data in people's respiratory tree, primarily the nasopharynx. There, locally, there was the UCSF study that looked at healthcare workers at UCSF. This was different than the Mission Bay study. They looked at uh, 3,600, about 3,600 healthcare workers at UCSF, and they found 0.4% 
had RNA in their um, oral, in their airways. These were asymptomatic carriers. A Stanford study looking at healthcare workers, about 11,000 of their healthcare workers had a, had a, a, a instance of 0.3%. That is 0.3% of healthcare workers who were healthy had the virus in their oropharynx. So the instance is probably somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4% and the prevalence US wise, maybe three to 5%. This is a dashboard from the Johns Hopkins um, site that is an excellent site to follow. I just wanted to point out a couple things about that. I took it from this morning at around 10 a.m. And the four leading countries in terms of the number of cases are the United States, Russia, Brazil, and the United Kingdom. The United States comprises about four and a half, four point seven percent of the world population, and and it uh, accounts for about twenty five percent of the um, uh, cases on the planet. The United States has not done very well with this uh, controlling this disease. If we look at the number of deaths, we're approaching one hundred thousand. We'll probably get there by the end of this month. Um, the deaths in New York account for probably about a third of all the deaths. Now the cases in the United States are not evenly distributed. Uh, the really dark co color here reflect greater than 40,000 cases. And we see the states that have these, a lot of cases. And then we see other states that have very little. This is typical of a pandemic where it doesn't uniformly spread through a population. It's sort of like a fire that occurs here and then embers fly over to other places. And that's what we will see and we'll see repeatedly these hot spots come up. For example, in New Orleans, we saw the hot spot come up after Mar Mardi Gras. If we look at the data in California, um, this is data from the 19th from a couple days ago. And you see the numbers up here of cases. And these are the numbers, counting the numbers of deaths that we've seen. And the bulk of the cases, as we see up here, are as demonstrated by the circles. The bulk of the cases have been in Los Angeles, whereas you see the, in Santa Clara County and Alameda up here, far fewer. And I'll go through some more detail about that. I wanted to talk locally about the epidemiology. Uh, this was the Mission Bay study that I had mentioned before, done by UCSF. Um, and this is a picture taken from the San Francisco Chronicle a couple of, three, three or four days ago. Um, so in looking at that population, there were over 3,000 people that were screened in Mission Bay Area. Um, in looking at the ethnicity of the population, about 44% were Latinx. But if you look at the percentage of positive results that were found, these were positive results by RNA, uh, we see that 95% were Latinx. And if we look uh, at the more details about this population, we found that 90% of the people who got infected could not work from home. They don't have the luxury of doing that, that they earned less than $50,000 a year and that they averaged around three to five people living in their home. And this mirrors pretty well the zip codes of the distribution the darker colors representing the most cases and the zip codes representing um, the most cases are here and here. And if we look at Alameda County, we see the same phenomena where the darker color represents the higher number of cases per zip code. And we see that the zip codes of the least affluent areas of our county have the most cases. This is typical of all infectious diseases in general and certainly all pandemics where the least fortunate in our society or the most oppressed of our society, or both, um, are the ones that suffer the most. And if we look at these cases um, about who gets infected in Alameda County specifically, um, we see that 37% um, of the cases are in Latinx, whereas they, they comprise only 22% of the population. Uh, in African Americans, 15% of the cases were the say comprised about 10% of the population. These are the total daily counts 
in Alameda County, and you can see the numbers have been pretty stable since around the middle of April. And now we look at deaths in Alameda County. These numbers have also been stable, two deaths per day. And we had this period of two days earlier this week, or Sunday and Monday, of no deaths, but then it jumped back up to at least to one death. And if we look at the deaths in terms of some of the features of them, we note that males are more likely to die than females. This is a characteristic of almost all infectious diseases where the mortality rates in males are greater than females. And if we look at the age group, this is not surprising to see, but the bulk of the people who died were over 80 and the next largest group were people over 70 and then it dropped off in the 60s and 50s. So if we look in Alameda County of deaths, um, we see that uh, in the Latinx population, the percent of the population, the number of deaths were about the same, maybe a little bit less. But this is what's so striking. African Americans comprise about 10% of Alameda County residents, but account for 23% of the deaths. So what is the case fatality rate? This is a moving target. When we first started with this pandemic, the case fatality rates were reported in anywhere from uh, three to almost five and a half percent. And as we've done more testing, the denominator gets larger, the case fatalities drop. So let me put COVID-19 in perspective. Ebola has a case fatality rate of about 50%, MERS about 35%. Thank goodness it doesn't spread very well. Smallpox had a mortality rate of about 30%, SARS about close to 10%. The great 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, somewhere between two and 4% of um, mortality rates. And that resulted in a conservative estimate of about 50 million deaths in one year on the planet and about 500,000 in the United States. Measles has a mortality rate of about two in a thousand. Seasonal influenza has a mortality rate of about 0.1%. If we look at COVID, um, the best guesses right now for mortality rates are sometimes, case, case fatality rates are somewhere between 0.5 and 1%. Um, an estimate in the Health Affairs article that was published three days ago suggested the mortality rates could range from case fatality rates from 0.6% to 2.1%. Of course, a lot of this depends upon the population that you're looking at. And, and as I'll talk about in a moment, it's very age dependent. The R naught that you've probably heard a lot of people talk about, uh, this is the reproductive number, how many people will one person infect. Right now, the R naught is below one which means that the um, number of cases will not be uh, exponentially growing. Um, we're somewhere, best estimate is we're somewhere between 0 0.85 and 0 0.9 in, the, in Alameda County. In the United States, we're just not sure. And so this is a really a guesstimate, but probably around two. Uh, earlier in the pandemic, we were thinking the R naught was probably closer to three. It's interesting, if we look at France, it went from an R naught of 2.9 to 0 0.67 when they instituted a lockdown. Uh, it's projected that after that lockdown uh, ends, which is just ending right about now, that it's going to, the R naught's going to go up to 1.8 to 4.7. And you can see the significant differences with an R naught of, for example, just 1.1 compared to an R naught of 1, or here we are at 0 0.9. What's the incubation period? The incubation period is the period from the moment you're infected to when you get sick. And the data has been pretty consistent on this. It's somewhere between five and six days. So from the time you get infected, it's between five and six days when people get sick. The range is two to 14 days. Um, less than two days um, uh, would represent less than 2% of the population would get sick and greater than uh, 13.5 days would be less than 2% of the population. 2.5% of the population would get sick. 
So almost everybody gets sick right in this period of time, five, maybe to around seven days, then it really starts to drop off precipitously. And if what is the illness time to hospitalization? That is when you get sick, how long are you sick at home before you go to bed, uh, get, go to the hospital? And this is early data, as you see here from China, that suggested that it was about nine days before people, seven to nine days before people went to the hospital. The data here in the United States more recently would suggest it's less than that, probably around five to six days. But I think the important point tucked into this is that people get sick, but they're not desperately ill. They often feel, um, they don't appreciate that they're short of breath often. Um, and then they get suddenly very sick. And typically this occurs day three, four, five, six, or seven, right in that period of time. That seems to be, those seem to be the critical days when people are either gonna turn and get better or turn and get worse pretty precipitously. Do we develop immunity? Well, I can absolutely answer this question and it is in the affirmative. We do develop immunity. The reason I can answer that is because the vast majority of people infected with this virus get well. And they get well with no intervention by doctors. That is, there's no medication that's getting them well. I'll talk about remdesivir in a moment. Um, so that means that our immune system works almost always against this virus. And I'll refer to this again when I talk about the natural history of disease. The biggest questions relate to what antibodies correlate with immunity. That's called humoral immunity. And what role does cell mediated immunity play? And these are questions that have not been adequately answered yet. And tied to that question about antibodies is if antibodies correlate with immunity, which there's good evidence that they do, which antibodies do do that because we make a lot of different antibodies to this virus. That remains to be clearly uh, delineated. Now we can look at other SARS, other coronaviruses to get a sense of immunity. Um, SARS-CoV-1 wasn't around long enough to do a lot of studies, but people who did get infected and got well, uh, antibodies tended to drift off around three, eight, after about three years although some people continue to have antibodies that are neutralizing. Um, with MERS, we don't really have very good data, but it looks like it's closer to two to three years, although some evidence suggests it may be a little longer. With those human coronaviruses that cause the common cold, anywhere from one to three years uh, and, the, and, and immunity is lost. And that's one of the reasons we get repeated colds because again, these, uh, these, human, these four human coronaviruses cause about a third of human colds. So bottom line, it looks like we clearly develop immunity, uh, but our immunity appears to not be lifelong. Like if you get measles as a child, you're never gonna get it again. We also have models from uh, macaques, as you see a picture here. The recent, the rhesus macaque models uh, clearly show that um, when challenged with the virus again, after um, being infected, uh, that they are immune. This was at 35 days, so we don't know how long that immunity would last. So that's our, the best overview I can give you of do we develop immunity. How is it transmitted? This remains somewhat controversial still, but there are certain things we really do know now. And one is that this is the most important way by droplets. And I'll show you some more information on that in a moment. Um, airborne remains somewhat controversial, but it's most assuredly the virus can spread in an airborne fashion um, as opposed to droplets. Um, but we don't think from an epidemiologic standpoint that that's nearly as important as droplets. Fomites are inanimate objects the data is less clear. The CDC just this week modified its statement about fomites saying that we need more data, and that's true. But it wasn't clear why they modified it because there's no new science on this. That is, we know the virus can survive on inanimate objects um, for a while, and I'll give you some data on that in a moment. Uh, but we don't know whether there's enough virus to transmit from my hand going to that inanimate object to my mouth, nose, or eye. 
At this point, we have to assume there is and take precautions. And there, the virus is found in other places. We find it in the feces, or at least we find the viral RNA in the feces. It can also be found in semen, and it's found in intraocular fluid. Uh, there's no evidence of fecal spread. Um, we don't have any evidence yet of sexually transmitted spread. Um, and there's, so I think that if we're looking at this, here is far and away the most important. This is likely plays a role, and airborne likely plays a role, but probably the least, possibly the least. So when we look at, in this case, sneezing, but when we talk loudly or coughing, we expire lots of different size particles ranging anywhere from less than five microns to over 100 microns in size. And usually those that are 10 or, 10 or greater microns in size are heavy, much heavier than air and fall to the ground within six feet. The smaller ones can stay in the air for longer periods of time. And I'll show you some data on that in a moment. And we also have had elegant studies done uh, with <clears throat> trying to simulate um, what would happen with SARS-CoV-2, but in very controlled environments, um, what happens when somebody talks loudly, coughs or sneezes, and, and clearly there are airborne viral particles that will remain in the air for a good while and can spread far further than six feet. The question is whether there's enough to cause infection, and that remains a terribly important question. So this is data published in the New England Journal in, um, on March 16th, looking at SARS-CoV-1 here and SARS-CoV-2 in terms of the viral titers log of 10 and time post uh, aerosolization lasting at, uh, up to three hours. And this is that same study that they looked at the survival of both SARS-CoV-1 and 2 on various objects, plastic, steel, cardboard, and copper. And with copper, for example, it was gone, pretty much gone by about four hours. Um, by cardboard, it was gone within a day. Um, by steel, it was gone within about 48 hours. And with plastic, it could survive uh, up to about close to 48 to 72 hours, or at least you could find this was, excuse me, this was viable virus. The question is how much viable virus is there on there relative to how much you need to infect yourself. And that, that remains why we're confused about how important fomites are. To give a contrast, influenza survives about 24 hours on hard surfaces. So who is contagious? Um, we know that asymptomatic transmission occurs, but it's not nearly as common as with symptomatic transmission. People are contagious about two days before they become symptomatic. Um, the longest we've found viable virus by culture has been nine, uh, nine to 10 days after people became symptomatic. The highest amount of viral particles in somebody who's symptomatic are about 12 to 24 hours before people become symptomatic to the first two days of symptoms, then it starts to drop down. If you're asymptomatic, the amount of viral particle shed is much less. This was an interesting study published in the uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report on March 30th, where they looked at um, people who were living in a family situation where one individual had uh, SARS-CoV-2, if that person was asymptomatic, the transmission to other members in the family, the attack rate was just under 0.5%, so it rarely happened. But if that person was symptomatic, it was almost 11% of the family members would get infected. And then finally, there's this issue of what are called super spreaders. We saw this with SARS in 2002 and 2003, and we've seen it with other infectious diseases as well. And these are people, and we don't understand why this is the case and whether it's um, something about the individual, their immune response, or whether the virus itself and its interaction with that individual are very confused about this issue. But it's clear that some people are what are called super spreaders, and that is they can infect, one person can infect 
an awful lot of people. This is a report from the 19th of this month, just a couple of days ago in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, looking at uh, different gatherings um, and church events. And I find this, this was very interesting in terms of large outbreaks and church events. And I find this an interesting when one juxtaposes it to a lot of the issues, including in today's Chronicle report of, of um, churches suing the state, um, saying that they should be handled differently. And we see significant outbreaks in this setting. How long are you contagious? I mentioned earlier that we found viable virus up to 10 days, but never longer than that in somebody who's symptomatic. We can find RNA in people who have been sick up to um, over a month. One report of 42 days, we can find RNA, uh, but not viable virus. So um, we, this remains an area of confusion in terms of when people should be considered no longer contagious. Is it finding no virus or is it finding no, finding no virus or no RNA? And um, we don't really have a great answer for that yet. Most people feel that um, uh, it's safe to take people out of isolation after they've been at least three days completely recovered. So they have no fever, no more symptoms, and it's been at least 10 days have passed since their symptoms first appeared. A more conservative method of bringing people back to the, out of isolation would be complete resolution of, resolution of fever. Their symptoms have improved, not completely necessarily gone, but improved, but they've had two negative RNA tests 24 hours apart. So these are the two major ways that um, we consider taking people out of isolation. Just a picture of 1918-1919 and um, a very similar view except with no patients yet in it when Wuhan was preparing for the catastrophe. So what is the natural history of this disease? I'm not going to go into pathogenesis, uh, which is a fascinating subject, but I, I want to just say that what our best understanding today is that there's an unusual dance going on between this virus and our immune system. The vast majority of people, as I mentioned, our immune system handles it well, and we don't get any symptoms or we get minimal symptoms. Some people get sicker, and I'll show you some data on that in a moment, and some people, of course, get very sick and some of those folks die. We think that it's the this dance that's going on where sometimes it gets perturbed um, by the virus, perhaps uh, not affecting, affecting parts of our immune system, but not other parts, leading to an explosive response by the human immune system, typically after about day five to seven. Uh, and this explosive response leading to the release of a lot of inflammatory mediators in our body leads to a lot of the disease that we see. But let's go on and look at the natural history in terms of what happens to people when they get infected. Somewhere between 70 and 80% of people who get infected either don't know it, probably half of those people don't even know it, that is they're asymptomatically infected, and the other half have, much like the human coronavirus is a cause of cold, very minimal symptoms, not enough to pay attention to. Around 15% of people um, get severely infected, but not so much that they have to be in the intensive care unit, but they often need hospitalizations. Uh, these are primarily respiratory infections of the lower respiratory tree. They're short of breath, coughing with high fever. They're pretty miserable. Um, they almost always get well. About 5% of people are so sick that they need to go into the intensive care unit. And about half of those people wind up being intubated and put on a ventilator. And about half of those people die. So we see that the natural history of this disease is the vast majority are minimally affected, if at all. Some people get very sick. Some people get very, very sick. And a very small percentage of people die. And this is showing very much the same thing, but at the onset, the people who are minimally ill, they almost always get well. Very, very few go on to dying. If you're moderately ill, 
the vast majority of people get well. If you're severely ill, people tend to get well. Even if you're critically ill, people tend to get well. But you can see that the amount of people going on to die are really in these two categories. The characteristic symptoms, I think most of you are pretty familiar with this now. Uh, people complain of a cough. Usually it's dry. That is, they don't bring up anything. Some people do bring up some, but usually it's a dry cough. Curiously, um, people ultimately will complain of shortness of breath, but they often don't appreciate it. Um, that is, they're breathing as opposed to 12 to 14 times a minute, which is normal. They may be breathing 20 to 22 to 24 times a minute, but they won't notice it. But if you check their oxygen saturation, it's often very low. Um, this has been an area of intense investigation as to why this characteristically occurs. So even if people are complaining of shortness of breath, if they're sick with the cough and fever, um, uh, suggesting COVID, this would be a time to um, be checking one's uh, oxygen saturation on a regular basis. Um, other complaints are listed here, but this has been a curious new complaint. Um, the loss of taste or smell, it's really smell because smell accounts for most of our ability to taste things. And um, this has been a fairly consistent observation in a lot of people with uh, COVID-19. Another one that I haven't listed here is called um, perniosis, which is uh, the finger, acral perniosis, which is the fingertips and toe tips get blue and purple. Um, this we think is an immune reaction. Um, it doesn't portend a bad nor good prognosis, but it's been an interesting observation as well. The people who are most at risk of having severe disease include those people listed here. I want to focus primarily on age um, because that certainly pertains to our audience today. And we know that age is directly correlated with increased morbidity and mortality. What we don't know is how well, how much of it is an independent risk factor, independent of all these other things that are characteristically associated with age, with the exception of smoking. And the complications of this disease have been myriad, and they continue. It seems like every couple of weeks we learn about new complications. Adult respiratory distress syndrome, this is this overwhelming inflammatory process in the lungs that I was referring to earlier. Uh, it causes a lot of tissue destruction in the lungs. Our ability to exchange air becomes impaired. And without being on a ventilator, um, we can't support ourselves in terms of enough oxygenation. And even with a ventilator, sometimes it cannot. And that's, those are the people who die or wind up going to lung transplantation. An interesting observation is that uh, cardiac complications are not uncommon in those people who are very ill. Um, and this may relate to the fact that, probably relates to the fact that ACE2 and, uh, receptors are found in the myocardium, as I mentioned earlier. Thrombotic events or blood clotting events have been common in some of these others. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome and secondary bacterial infections are certainly reported. But I want to just spend a moment talking about PIMS or pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, this is the case definition by the CDC. It, it occurs in people, it's not been reported in people over the age of 20. These, these children have, are sick with high sustained fevers. They look sick. Um, they wind up being hospitalized. They have a rash that um, tends to be migratory. Um, they often have two or more other organ systems involved. And <clears throat> there's no other plausible diagnosis. We don't know why this occurs. Uh, it's similar to a disease that was described in the 1950s called Kawasaki syndrome, but that only occurs in children less than five years of age. There's a lot of investigation about this at this point. To put it in perspective, there have been less than 150 cases reported in the United States as a whole, and there have been thousands and thousands of cases that have occurred in children, and the vast majority of children don't get sick at all or get minimally ill. How do we diagnose this? We have three tools. The RNA test that I've been talking about, this is an example of how to get it from the nasopharynx. The antibody test, 
and the hardly used antigen test. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, PCR test for RNA is useful in detecting very early in the infection. This would be symptom onset. So it's present before people get sick. So we, by the time people present, they should have PCR positive. I'll come back to that in a moment. But it doesn't last for a long period of time. The RNA is usually gone. Um, antibody detection usually occurs by about week two and should remain positive for the duration of the person's life. But we don't know that for sure at this point, of course, since we've only had five months experience with this. And we don't know how many of these antibodies will be protective. If we look at the sensitivity and specificity of the RNA testing, it's got, it's very sensitive, or moderately sensitive, excuse me, uh, but it's exquisitely specific. That is a positive test, it's almost always a true positive test. A negative test does occur, um, it can, occurs anywhere from 5% of the time to 30% of the time, and a lot of that is dependent upon when the person is studied. This was published just this week. This is a study published just this week in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It looked at the time from infection, which was day one here. This was day five. And the percentage, the probability of having a negative PCR in people who are, are truly infected. If you, if you check within day one or two, they're almost always negative, even though they are infected. Here's where you start to pick up um, the uh, the cases uh, down here by day five, you're, you're going to pick up at least 75, 70, 75 percent of the people who are positive. And you see down here, it even gets better in terms of a greater uh, sensitivity, and then it tends to get worse again. Um, so it really depends upon when the test is done. And that's why if somebody looks like and smells like and tastes like they've got uh, COVID, uh, even if the test is negative, we have to consider that diagnosis and we should repeat that test. And this is a limitation of the test in terms of saying if you have a negative test, you're, you're, you don't, you're not infected. Um, and so this presents a problem from a public health standpoint as well. The antibody test, um, let's just list some criteria for the antibody testing in terms of where it's useful. The problem with this test is it's got a lot of false positives. Even though its specificity is good, um, the prevalence of the disease is so low that a false positive still occur, and they can occur up to 40% of the time, which makes it close to a flip of the coin sometimes. Um, this is a good test for determining prevalence. It's not particularly a good test, but it's the best we have for identifying people who might be uh, plasma donors because they would have antibodies. Um, and if somebody has been sick for more than two weeks and they have a negative antibody test, it would argue against that person having COVID because antibodies usually are present by two weeks. In terms of treatment, not worth spending a lot of time about. Remdesivir, probably most of you are familiar with. It uh, did show efficacy in terms of reducing hospital stay from 15 to 11 days, which is significant. It was statistically significant. The deaths were not statistically significant, but there was a trend. Um, and uh, for what it's worth, um, uh, the study was stopped too early to know whether that trend would have continued to make it statistically significant or not. So at this point, we cannot say that remdesivir decreases deaths. Uh, the lopinavir, ritonavir, combined with the interferon study uh, was disappointing. Um, there are ongoing studies using uh, hyperimmune gamma globulin, that is people who've recovered, and there's um, work now just starting on giving monoclonal antibodies, but that's too preliminary. There's absolutely no good evidence that uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is a prophylactic for this disease or um, treats this disease. Uh, there is good evidence that it has cardiac toxicity. Um, there have been multiple studies that have been done, they're more ongoing, but uh, this was just, in my opinion, nonsense. Tocilizumab was interesting. It blocks IL-6, which is a, um, a chemokine that triggers what's called that cytokine storm or the release of so many chemicals at once that cause inflammation. Um, studies are ongoing with this. Uh, azithromycin, no evidence that it's effective, and so on. So how do you prevent this infection? Um, this is a great statement made by uh, uh, an infectious disease infection control physician at 
at um, Harvard, he said, the moment we're no longer wondering whether we should be doing it, it's too late. So I think you're all aware of the things that the individual can do, and we can talk about this if you have specific questions, but these I think are pretty, pretty well known, so I'll skip over these. Um, and from a public perspective, public health perspective, we failed completely with containment, so we quickly went to mitigation to try and keep the number of cases underneath the healthcare system capacity. And we saw that this failed in New York. Um, it did not fail in California. And this was a report from today's New York Times looking at if we had just uh, sheltered in place one week earlier, what the difference would have been in terms of the number of deaths reported. So we were slow on the uptake with this virus. This was from 1918-1919 and it looked at Philadelphia and St. Louis. St. Louis kept people sheltering in place during a time Philadelphia had a big parade and continued to let people not shelter in place. And this is the difference in terms of the death rate per 100,000 population between those two cities. We saw something not as dramatic between Oakland and San Francisco compared to Los Angeles, where Los Angeles actually in this 1918-1919 pandemic had people shelter in place longer than Northern California did. This was a study that was from, from SARS-CoV-2 done this year, uh, just a couple months ago that looked at Iowa and Illinois. Uh, Illinois uh, had people shelter in place, Iowa did not, and this was the difference in the number of cases. So we see how important sheltering in place is. So if asked the question, how do we prevent infection? You have people shelter in place. Um, how do you prevent infections by a vaccine? These are some of the vaccines that you've been hearing about. These, are, these were in the news this week. Um, very preliminary data. Lots of skepticism about why um, Moderna published their data other than to raise their stock value uh, because they only had eight cases. Um, but nevertheless, there's some encouragement about both of these types of vaccines. The subunit vaccines are primarily directed against that spike protein I talked about earlier. This just goes into some of the details about how, the, how we put RNA into people to program our own cells to messenger RNA to program our own cells to produce the spike protein excuse me, to produce the antibody to the spike protein. So how do you decide when people should go back to work? This is the criteria that's used here in um, uh, Northern California in the six, six counties of uh, Bay Area. If we look just at Alameda County, um, we use criteria of our flat or decreasing number of cases, yes. <clears throat> is our hospital capacity below 50%? Yes. Is our number of hospitalizations flat or decreasing? Yes. Um, do we have adequate testing? No. Um, we wanted to get up to 200 per day. We're at about 60 per day. And um, tracing and PPE, we're still not there yet. And you can see that the answer is no to almost all, all of these. So what's going to happen? Um, lots of different models. This is just one of many, many models that have been uh, shown. Um, this is what happened in 1918 and 1919, where they had what was called a herald wave that occurred in June and was gone by July, similar to what we experienced a little bit earlier here. And then it was quiescent in the summer, and then it exploded with incredible virulence in October. And then there was another serious spike in the winter of 19, 2019, 1919, and then it was gone, essentially gone. It, it didn't go away. Um, it, it seemed to lose its virulence after that roughly one year. So what are the scenarios that we can expect? Uh, these are three that were published by the Centers for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Uh, and this is the 1918-1919 scenario. Here's where we are right now. This is a scenario that if we um, shelter in place and then stop sheltering in place and then shelter in place and stop sheltering in place, what we can look towards. This is a scenario where we shelter in place like we've done now, stop sheltering in place, uh, and then, the then we have an explosion of disease either later in the summer or my guess would be October. 
And this is a scenario where we shelter in place and then we cautiously let people back to work, monitoring very closely the number of cases, um, having good contact tracing so that we can identify those infected and, and put them in uh, isolation, and then keep that process up and we'll see these slow undulations until we have something that ends the, either the virus itself changes or we have a vaccine or a therapeutic. Notice with all three of these scenarios, it's up to us which one we wanna be in. So what's gonna happen? Will the virus display seasonality? We have no idea. Uh, the coronavirus has caused the cold do. Uh, we don't know about SARS-CoV-1 because it was gone by the summer. Um, MERS has continued throughout the year. We see uh, SARS-CoV-2 in climates that are summer-like. Um, so it's, it's anybody's guess about whether it'll decrease in the summer. More people will be outside more in the summer, which will help. Uh, will it behave like SARS and go away? No evidence that that's going to happen. This, this one transmits just too well person to person as opposed to SARS did. Uh, how well will, we, will containment and mitigation work? It's up to us. And in which direction will the virus evolve? Theoretically, the virus should evolve towards more benignity. That is, it makes sense from the virus's perspective to not, make, to not kill your host. Uh, if you don't kill your host, you're gonna spread from person to person. Uh, so the ideal arrangement is not to make the, not to pay, make the person too sick, but do make them cough and sneeze. Um, it, that may happen. It could also become more virulent. Uh, that may have happened with 2000, excuse me, 1918, 1919 uh, in the fall when we had that explosion. We don't know. So this is a quote from Joshua Lederberg, Lederberger, Lederberg, excuse me, the uh, Nobel Prize winner. It's our wits versus our genes. And remember, it took the human genome, the human species, 8 million years to evolve by 1% of our genome. And animal RNA viruses can evolve by more than 1% in a matter of days. So I'll leave you with Pandora, who opened the box and let out all the evils, but then slammed it shut. One thing was left, and that was hope. So I apologize for going over. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm happy to stay on if there are questions, but I realize that I talk longer than I should have. Thank you very much, John. That was... Uh really wonderful. You covered an enormous amount of material. I kept thinking of things I wanted to ask you and you managed to answer an awful lot of them um, in, in, during the talk itself. One, one specific question that I have right now, um, given the audience that, that, that we have for this Excel's event, is what specific um, things can you say for an audience uh, like this one where a typical age might be 75, our age. Um, I can say that we should be the last people to stop sheltering in place. Um, we are clearly in a high risk group. Now, as I said earlier, I don't know whether that age is, in an, I'm, I think age is an independent risk factor. How much of a greater risk is it between somebody who's 75 and healthy or somebody who's 75 and has comorbidities, I don't know. The bottom line is um, we're going to be the last folks to come out of sheltering in place. Do you go to the market? No, I send my wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, she ha actually has, she's a lot younger than I am, though. <laughs> no, um, yes. Um, but, you know, going to the market has become a... Um, uh, an exercise in uh, uh, in fear of fear. It's, 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 it feels like a dangerous place to go to. Uh, we are very cautious when we do it um, and like to use uh, places where we can use pickup, uh, where people will put it in our in the trunk of our car. Okay, um, Ben, maybe I'll switch over and let you go through some of the questions that we got from uh, from the audience through the chat. Great. Um, so what, one quick question from Annette, why is there no vaccine for the four common cold coronaviruses? 
That's a great question. Actually, there was a there was a lot of work in the '60s on the common cold viruses. Those uh, uh, two of those four, um, and they were able to develop a vaccine that, in a small number of humans, um, caused uh, uh, caused humoral immunity. Uh, that is, humans developed antibodies to the vaccine, um, and they were neutralizing antibodies. Uh, because it was just the common cold, it was considered ethically okay to re-challenge those people who developed antibodies with, with the virus. And they did re-challenge them after, I think it was about two weeks uh, after they developed antibodies. And seven of those eight people got the cold again. <laughs> so the research that was going into developing a, a vaccine for the common cold, that really put a, a nail in the coffin to that research. There has been research since then, but it's a very difficult virus to develop an immune response to, that at least an immune response that sustains itself. And we don't know why that is. You know, why, as I mentioned, should, if we get measles, we're immune for the rest of our lives? And why is it with these coronaviruses that the immunity seems to be much more short-lived? Great, let me, let me ask another question. Um... There's a question about, uh, I guess Bob had it on transportation. It's a large issue. Uh, do you have any advice for people for using airplanes or public transportation, yes. kids in school buses? Well, let's separate, if, if we're talking about our group, my advice would be not to use public transportation and not to fly or go through an airport. <clears throat> um, if we're talking about kids, um, up until this PIMS or pediatric um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, um, the risk to kids appeared to be so low. Kids rarely got sick, and if they did, it was rarely serious. Now, rarely a kid child would get really sick, wind up hospitalized, and there have been deaths, but there've been very few. Um, prior to this PIMS, we there was not much worry about children. And frankly, there still isn't, um, but we need a better understanding of how significant and how common PIMS is. So um, right now, I, the recommendation would be to, um, for children, pretty much the same as for adults, because even if kids don't get very sick, we know they get infected and they carry the virus and they can spread it to adults. So mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. <clears throat> I've had a couple of questions about um, something called fama, famotidine, pepsid. Famotidine, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's perfectly fine to take if you need it. It's used for um, uh, acid production. I'm not sure what the question, maybe that question came from the fact that we know that people um, use drugs that suppress acid production have a higher risk of pneumonia in the hospital, but I'm not sure. Perhaps whoever was asking a question can explain that a little better. Like the question was, is it, uh, um, is it a possible treatment? Oh, no evidence for that, no. Mike, Mike Janowitz, do you want to clarify your uh, question? Yeah, just uh, something I saw, I think in the New York Times, uh, that first of all, there was a study in China that uh, showed that people who had reflux uh, uh, and, were, and were taking famotidine seemed to be uh, doing better. And then there's some anecdotal evidence in New York. And apparently, I read there's a study going on now. So I wondered if you'd heard about it. I, I had heard about those reports, but I was pretty skeptical of them. They were all anecdotal. Um, there is a study that's, that's ongoing. I didn't know it was with Fomotidine, but um, I don't know any data about that. I, I'll check on it though. Thank you. Sure. Um, let me ask a question about uh, the um, super spreaders. Are they mostly asymptomatic? Someone had asked that question. No, they're usually symptomatic. Um, there was a, one person in a, um, there was the choir outbreak in Seattle. Um, that student was minimally, was 
modestly symptomatic, that is, didn't have a high fever, could go to the choir, but did have respiratory symptoms. Uh, there was, in the, <clears throat> in the church outbreaks that I mentioned, people were symptomatic. And another question is, uh, there were some early reports um, about blood type might be a factor? Yes, there were early reports of blood type, blood group A, um, having higher morbidity and mortality. Um, I haven't heard any confirmation of that. Um, it would not be surprising if uh, there was some association with some of the blood grouping groupings because um, we've seen that before with other infectious diseases, malaria being a classic example. That particularly, that report particularly upset me because I'm blood group A. <laughs> um, there's a question here about the uh, possibility of the cytokine storm being uh, mitigated by prednisone. Prednisone has been tried, uh, corticosteroids have been tried in people who are very ill the results have been mixed, those trials continue. Um, it theoretically makes sense that since a lot of the damage that occurs to us in causing severe morbidity and mortality relates to um, the cytokine storm, uh, prednisone is sort of a blunt instrument to turn that off. That's why that drug tocilizumab, it's a monoclonal antibody, has been used and there's another uh, monoclonal antibody that's in trial now to try and selectively turn off parts of the immune response for people that are in that cytokine storm. So um, another question we had here is uh, if the, well, two questions, I guess, if 70, you said 70 to 80 percent are okay, uh, people have mild symptoms or none, does that include people over 70? I mean, or what, what would the percentage be for people over 70? It's less, but we don't have good data on that yet. But it's, it, people older are not only more likely to get sick, but they're more likely to be, as I mentioned, seriously ill. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't have a precise number. We know that um, we found asymptomatic carriers in, um, in people in their 80s. So we know that people can be asymptomatically infected um, as they age. Um, we've, we've, noted, we've noted a lot of cases of uh, people with colds due to this virus in their 70s and 80s. So it, it's the entire spectrum, but the, inspector, the spectrum shift has shifted to the right on that. Uh -huh. And one question from someone, do we have to wait for a vaccine before flying or using BART? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, um, I don't know. I, I, the, this, is, this whole topic is moving so fast, its behavior in the human population is changing so much that I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not allowing myself to think that far in advance. Mm -hmm. um, so I can only say that that's what we need to do now. So um, let me ask a couple more maybe, it's getting, since it's getting late. With uh, age and underlying respiratory uh, issues, does it make sense to have one of these tests um, with no COVID systems, but with allergies or cold systems, uh, symptoms? I guess, I think that question is getting at, should we get the antibody test to see if we've been infected already and got over it? Is that? Yeah. Um, I guess so. <laughs> I'll try that one because I think yeah. that, that's, a, I get that question a ton. Um, the answer is um, no. I think you're throwing your money away. These labs that have set up, they, they, they really are just preying on people's fears and they charge a lot of money for those tests and the information is suspect. The reason I say that is because, with, as I mentioned earlier, with the low prevalence of disease, even though the, the specificity might be 99%, uh, if the prevalence is 3%, you're gonna have close to 30% false positive tests if you test a thousand people. So um, if you get the test and it's positive, you don't know whether it's a true positive, that's the first problem. But let's say it is a true positive. The second problem is 
we don't know whether the antibodies they're detecting are protective, protecting you or not. So that's a problem. And then the third problem is that we don't know if they are protecting you, we don't know how long they're gonna be able to protect you. Will it be a month, three months, a year, three years? We just don't know. So um, with all of those caveats, those three caveats, I just I don't, don't see a role for that. I see the role for the antibody test, as I mentioned, for epidemiology studies and colleagues of mine in the School of Public Health are, are doing those right now. Let me ask a question. Uh, Howard asked the question, how reliable is the reporting of morbidity and mortality? Um, I think so many different people are doing it from so many different angles that it's pretty reliable. Um, that question may be getting at um, a political question, and that is, is data being suppressed? Um, I don't know. I'm not, I don't have firsthand knowledge that that's the case. Um, I read reports of how, um, you know, Trump saying that let's not do so much testing because then we won't have so many cases. Um, that said, um, I don't have any direct evidence that the data coming out of the Centers for Disease Control has been manipulated. Um, I read stories about it in the newspapers just like you did. That Hopkins site that I used is a very good one, but there are multiple very good sites. So one other question about the masks. Someone asked which types of uh, N95 masks are most effective? Well, the N95 mask is what we use in the hospital. And to, give, to put it in perspective, in the hospital, we've, we had a lot of cases in um, healthcare workers early in this pandemic but we're seeing the number of healthcare workers that are getting infected very significantly dropping off in the last six weeks or so. And that's because we really understand a lot better how to prevent getting infected when we're working with patients with COVID. Um, the only time that healthcare workers wear an N95 mask is when they're working with a patient with COVID, when they're within six feet, usually right on top of these people, and the procedure, they're doing a procedure that causes secretions to be aerosolized. Suctioning people if they're intubated, intubating people. Um, a dentist working in somebody's mouth would be another example of aerosolizing secretions. That's when you'd want to wear an N95 mask, along with face guard, uh, along with gown. Um, <clears throat> that works. What we found is in the hospitals, wearing a regular surgical mask is sufficient even when working with COVID patients, as long as you're not doing an aerosolized procedure. So what does that mean for us outside of hospitals? What it means is that wearing a mask is gonna offer us, no matter what mask we wear, short of an N95 mask is gonna offer us very little protection. Um, I can't put a percentage number on that, but I'm talking about a very small percentage of protection. What a mask will do, any kind of mask will do, will be to decrease the number of viral particles that will come out of my mouth and nose and could infect somebody else. So that's where wearing a mask is helpful. What kind of mask should you wear? Um, the cloth masks, just like a bandana, um, allow, a lot of virus to go out around the side of it. So something that fits snugly over your face, your nose and mouth. I see a lot of people wearing it just over their mouth, but it's got to cover the nose too. Um, and something thicker than just a, just a one layer of cotton would be helpful. And that will help decrease the particles that come out of your nose and mouth and infecting somebody else. So don't think if you have a mask on, you're really necessarily protecting yourself. Great, and here's uh, one quasi-optimistic question. <laughs> How is it that the virus completely disappeared in the 1918-19 pandemic? Well, in 1918-1919, it didn't disappear. It was an H1N1 virus. Now, influenza is an RNA virus like coronavirus, but it's structurally very different. It's a segmented RNA. And it, and it changes with much greater alacrity than coronaviruses do. And that H1N1 that caused that terrible pandemic over 
12 months period of time, it, the virus continued and continued to cause disease, but it was much milder in, the, in year two and got even milder in three and four. So, and we don't know why. So it's been a hundred years and we still don't understand why that virus killed so badly and then why it seemed to get less virulent pretty dramatically. The corollary to that question is the SARS question. Um, that is, where did it go after a year, less than a year, nine months? Um, we had a very aggressive international response to it, and it was not a virus that, that could spread person to person anywhere near like, nearly like um, SARS-CoV-2 does. And so our interventions were successful in stopping it. Uh, but it was pretty dramatic that it went away like that. We can be very optimistic and hope that's going to happen with um, SARS-CoV-2. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm pretty skeptical that well because it, it transmits so efficiently. John, let me ask one question. This is Bob. When can we imagine going to the gym or the workout club again? Um, that would probably be one of the last places we would want to go to, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, this, this virus has been, has been very inconvenient. Uh, our, our lives have been disrupted like nothing else that we've ever experienced, any of us here. Um, the last time we experienced anything like this was 100 years ago, 101 years ago. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to ask that question. I'm not, I'm not going to think about that question uh, because it's too painful. All right. Well, we thank you very much for giving us all this good information, all this uh, advice on how to take care of ourselves and what to watch for in, in the scientific developments that, uh, that, will be, that will be coming up in the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Again for, for taking the time to help us out with all these issues. And thank you very much for inviting me. Good Goodbye. Morning. He's a nice guy. Isn't he sweet? He's so lovely looking. Beautiful smile. <laughs>